Hey, this is Mike Maloney, and I want to start off with a joke. Ben Bernanke won the Nobel Prize. I swear to God, he won the Nobel Prize for destroying the world economy. Uh, this is like, it's not just a bad joke. The irony, this is, it, well, there's a, a uh, Zero Hedge article that says Ben Bernanke winning the Nobel Prize in economics is a sick joke. Now, this article came out uh, after I had determined that this was a really bad joke, and I was going to open the video this way, uh, but this article came out today. It is unbelievable. Everything that is about to happen over the next few years is about 92 to 98% one person's fault, Ben Bernanke. I mean, Alan Greenspan sort of backed him into a corner a little bit, and, and you know, he painted this Federal Reserve into a corner and then left. Ben Bernanke was there. But Ben Bernanke's response to the 2008 global financial crisis is what is going to cause, I mean, we've got Janet Yellen and uh, Jerome Powell with their total ineptness. Remember, inflation is transitory. It's only going to last a month or so. <laughs> um, they are completely inept at dealing with this thing that uh, Ben Bernanke left them with. And to paraphrase John Hussman, keeping a balance sheet of this size, you know, the Federal Reserve, keeping a balance sheet of this size is like keeping a nuclear bomb in the basement. Nothing good can come of it. <clears throat> uh, this man truly has destroyed the world economy, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. Things are getting more and more out of hand. So uh, we're going to deal a little bit with inflation in this video, but more on the other half of, you know, this is a hurricane that has had a giant eye. And the first part of the hurricane that we went through, the hurricane passed through, you know, we just went through Hurricane Fiona here in Puerto Rico. My uh, farm got 30 inches of rain in 30 hours and 100 mile an hour winds. But that's the first half of this giant donut shaped hurricane with this, an, an eye in a hurricane can exceed 200 miles across. And the more powerful the hurricane, the more calm the eye is. And, uh, and it just passed us, the, the first half, that was the global financial crisis of 2008. But uh, doing what Ben Bernanke did and what everybody else has had to do, they had, uh, Yellen and, and Powell had to follow in his footsteps uh, because of the way he changed the whole economics of the financial system. And what it has done is, is sped up the hurricane. It's added power to it. But that made the eye calmer. And as this passes, you're going to see that the second half of this hurricane, I'm sorry I'm laughing. The, the, the reason I laugh is the idiocy. I mean, uh, sometimes super smart people can do really dumb things. And uh, because... They can't see past their own super high IQs. They're all, almost always right. And so when they make a decision on something, they're so confident in it. I remember on 60 Minutes, Ben Bernanke, he was asked, uh, do you think you can get the balance sheet back to normal? And he said he was 100% certain, 100% confident that it was going to be no problem whatsoever. Well, we are trapped. So this article, Ben Bernanke winning the Nobel Prize in economics is a sick joke. Very worth reading. There is some very good stuff in here. Uh, another article, course EPI surges to 40-year highs, food and shelter costs soar. So today, the, uh, uh, the, the BS, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's the BLS, not the Bureau of Statistics, the BS, it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics that compiles the uh, CP lie. And uh, so they came out with the latest uh, consumer price index, and that has been in the news. And the markets tanked immediately on this really bad news, but then rallied and they went way up. So uh, they're closing the day uh, way up from where they were yesterday. I mean, when the markets opened today after the uh, CPI print, uh, they gapped down pretty severely. So headline CPI uh, is 8.2% uh, year over year. Uh, and if you look at some of these, there's a chart in here that shows it's, we're at the highest core CPI since 1982. 
And this is a very good article, worth a read. Uh, and then the next article is uh, why CPI is making the same, C, why the CPI is making the same huge mistake now as it did a year ago. And this is about rent inflation. Uh, and it's an analysis of how they calculate some of the CPI and how wrong they are. And then uh, it's a disaster. A shocked Wall Street reacts to CPI's nuclear bomb. And, you know, so paraphrasing John Hussman, a balance sheet of this size is like keeping a nuclear bomb in the basement. This is a very good article. It's a bunch of reactions from uh, financial advisors and, and people that uh, um, run big funds and such. But the best part is the end of the article. And now we sit back and wait for something to break. And that's what we're waiting for. As you probably know, I don't like to focus just on the CPI. Uh, the producer price index, what companies are paying, uh, is increasing at a far greater rate. And that has to trickle down into future inflation that's delayed by a couple of months. So here we have overall, there's food, there's energy, and this is uh, goods other than food and energy. So when you look at energy, which is a major component in producing everything and getting our stuff to market, uh, it's not as much of a component in services as it is in producing anything. But when you look at this, you've got um, energy up by a third, 33%. That's September. Well, you go back to September a year ago and you have 37% it was up. And then you go back to the September uh, before that and it was down 9.5%. And I took one and then minus the 9.5% uh, times the uh, 30, the one third times the one third. This is 75% from the, this, these deflated prices uh, after the COVID crash, the, uh, the pandemic plunge. Uh, and so 75% from where we were two years ago, because it's 33% on top of 33%. I was just talking to a friend in California, and they were talking about the prices of gasoline. So where is all of this coming from? Well, the Fed created all of this. It is 100% their fault. It starts with Ben Bernanke. It didn't really end. He inflated asset prices with the way that asset purchases work with the Federal Reserve. Powell uh, helped fund the Treasury sending out checks directly to U.S. citizens, and that has inflated retail prices. Uh, so uh, what we have here is checkable deposits and currency. So this is for households. Now, this is as of Q2. So this is the latest information. We have to wait uh, for another three months for, well, another two months. This was September, October, November, December. So December 9th, uh, we'll have an update for Q3 to see if this is starting to fall. But you have to realize that checking accounts and savings and currency is like a battery and the economy is like a circuit. So you've got this battery over here storing energy. And it got all charged up by the Federal Reserve. And then you've got goods and services and prices over here. And this is sort of a loop. And you've got the mood of the public. And this currency has no velocity. It is parked. This is the reason velocity fell so much. And so uh, it hasn't caused that much inflation. It has caused some. But this is still parked. And it can cause a whole lot more. Uh, there's a couple of resolutions for this. We can uh, either the Fed crushes the economy, puts you out of job if you're a business owner, puts your business out of business, makes things life just awful for everybody to try to treat the disease that they created. And it's not a cure. It is a treatment. They are trying to put Band-Aids on cancer. You know, you can uh, try to find a cure to cancer and you take a bunch of lab rats and you give those lab rats cancer and then you can treat it. One of the ways that you can treat it is kill a rat and the cancer is dead. <laughs> Will we die? I don't know. But 
What I do know is that they cause this and they're never treating the cause. They only treat the symptom. And I'm going to get back to Ben Bernanke treating the symptom in just a minute. But uh, this $4.7 trillion, you know, you look at it where it was before the pandemic and you're talking about a trillion. And now you're talking about $4.7 trillion, almost $5 trillion sitting in checking accounts waiting to come out. Now, it can come out, it can either, they can, they can cause their treatment to the cancer they've created by breaking everything, causing everybody's lives to be miserable, and that will keep prices from rising because people will be scared and this will stay in the checking accounts, but it will come out someday. If they continue to let inflation rage, eventually the public will go, oh, I've got all of this cash in my checking account and it's losing 8 10, 12% per year, because as you know, the CPI is the CP lie. So it's actually more than 8%. It's about 12, 15% per year that your currency is losing purchasing power. And there is a point at which the public's confidence in the currency breaks. And when you go into this uh, positive feedback loop where the more currency they create, the more the public has loss in faith in the currency's purchasing power. So they spend it as soon as they can get it. When this comes out, into circulation, you can see prices start to spiral out of control. When prices go up, all of the employees at the manufacturers and, and people provide, provide services, they all need cost of living wage increases, which causes the cost of the products that they make to even cost more, so prices have to go up even higher. This process has to continue until all of the excess currency that's in the currency supply is accounted for. Uh, now, the economy during a hyperinflation is horrible. It is awful. So they can create an awful economy by breaking it and causing a depression, or they can cause an inflationary uh, recession or even an inflationary... Uh, hyperinflations are hyperinflationary depressions that end in the ultimate deflation. You have a hyperinflation until one day there is no currency. Nobody wants to use it anymore. At that point, once the currency becomes worthless, you, you're in the end result of every hyperinflation is the ultimate deflation. So I want to bring you back to the Nobel Prize winner, Ben Bernanke. This is a quote, and it's a very old quote. And this quote is what kicked off my, it's one of the things that put me down this road of researching the economy, precious metals, monetary history, everything else. The U.S. government has a technology called a printing press, or today it's electronic equivalent, that allows it to produce as many U.S. dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. When I saw this back in like 2004 or something like that, I was already planning on my book back in like 2002, 3, 4. Uh, I didn't start writing it until 2005, but my first book. I've got another book coming out shortly. Um, and... Uh, I did some research to see where this quote came from. And it came from this speech. And everything that I've done in my life is based on being able to see the future from reading this one speech and decoding it. You have to, I mean, this is a long speech. It's uh, done in this complex economic language that like uh, creating numbers so high that only dogs can hear them. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, uh, language where he's trying to sound so smart, it just goes over your head and, and uh, you go, wow, this guy's really smart. He must know what he's doing. No, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's making this shit up. <laughs> this is just a bad joke. So uh, I encourage you to read this, but what you can do instead is you could watch this old video that I did. Uh, this is from an appearance back in 2016 at the Silver Summit in San Francisco. And here, I took that speech and I broke it down. First, I present the key parts of it, the parts of it that contain the stuff that you need to worry about and need to plan on for the future. And a whole bunch of this has yet to come true. A bunch of it already did. So reading this is what has protected me, what uh, sent me down this road entirely. But what I did was I took his speech and I just pulled out key words, and then you can see what it really means. So I've got Ben here, and then I've got Cool Ben. And uh, so I take 
his speech, and then I just highlight keywords, and you can see exactly what he means. And so here is the presentation, and here is Cool Ben, and it's got all of this gobbledygook in it, but it says some observers have concluded the central bank has no has run out of ammunition. Uh, a set, the central bank has not run out of ammunition. Under a paper monetary system, he doesn't know the difference between currency and money. Under a paper money system, uh, the central bank should always be able to generate inflation. That is what this paragraph says. But by putting all of these excess words in it, you don't read right away that, oh, this guy is talking about there's no problem. The central bank can always make inflation. <laughs> and that's what he was saying. We're going through the results of, of this 2002 speech right now. U.S. dollars have value only to the extent that they are strictly limited in supply. Um, but the U.S. government has a printing press that allows it to produce as many dollars as it wishes. By increasing the number of U.S. dollars in circulation, the U.S. government can reduce the value of a dollar. This is his speech in 2002. Don't worry about deflation. It's called uh, uh, deflation, making sure it doesn't happen here. You really should read some of this, but better yet, just watch this old video of mine. Uh, a determined government can always generate <laughs> inflation. Well, we did, and we are paying for it. He did, and we are paying for it. So before I wrote my book, I studied months and months and months. I read Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States. And the great thing about this book, it has these wonderful charts in it. They're not showing it. I couldn't find any pictures of the charts that were in the edition that I read, which was this one. But these charts would fold out about uh, three feet or four feet long. And I used to spend hours and hours and hours. I would come back to them day after day, just staring at these charts and trying to figure out what's going on in the chart. And in this, I, I identified this big dip in the producer price index and the currency supply that was twice as large as the Great Depression. And I used to make stage appearances with Robert Kiyosaki back in 2005 and six. And I'd say, how many here have heard of the Depression of 1921? The whole audience would put up their hands. One time, it was 30,000 people at the Los Angeles Convention Center. But a lot of these uh, real estate expos back then, they had 10,000 people, 15,000 people. Everybody would raise their hand. And then I'd say, 1921. And everybody's hand went down. And then years later, uh, Jim Grant wrote a book called The Forgotten Depression. Now everybody refers to it as the Depression of the 1921. I was the first one to call it that based on staring at these graphs for hour after hour after hour. And you can figure out when you've got the numbers, you can sort of figure out what happened when you've got a bunch of different sets of numbers. That was the great thing about these graphs. He had the, and these were all hand uh, drawn graphs. You could see where they had erased something and corrected it. Um, these big long graphs where he had the currency supply, the producer price index, the CPI, uh, 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 a whole bunch of different statistics all on one graph overlaid. And so I found it just absolutely fascinating. After I read Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States, I read a very entertaining book that was very easy to read. Murray Rothbard was a great author. He could communicate well. Professor of Economics at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. And uh, he was basically a, an Austrian economist. I mean, he believed uh, in uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises and, and uh, the other, all of the other, Friedrich Hayek and so on. And this was about the Great Depression. <laughs> and what's funny about it, it's titled America's Great Depression. He starts off with the creation of the Federal Reserve and goes all the way through the 20s and the inflationary run up and the stuff that caused the stock market boom. And then the crash and the depression starts and he's done. He's proven his case that it was the Federal Reserve and the inflationary run up and the, there, there were things that caused the Great Depression that we didn't need to do 
That was what caused the Great Depression. Then I read this awful book called Essays on the Great Depression by Ben S. Bernanke. It is truly a horrendous book. I don't recommend reading it, but I spent months and months, probably four months, trying to analyze this book, uh, circling things and, and, and re referring to other pages and stuff. And I came to the conclusion, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He made all this crap up. He's trying to solve this cancer problem by figuring out balance sheets and stuff and trying to figure out how to slap a Band-Aid on cancer. He starts with the bank runs of the 30s. He ignores what, ha what, what he didn't ask, what caused the depression? What caused the bank runs of the 30s? He didn't ask any of that. He just says, this is the problem. This is how we fix it. And this is the problem. You know, he's a super smart person that just uh, came to these conclusions, believes it wholeheartedly, and then he took action based on this. He never looked at what created the problem in the first place. How do you, best way to cure cancer? Prevent it. Don't let it happen. And so uh, this is the Federal Reserve's balance sheet as of today. And before Ben Bernanke, back here in, uh, in 2008, uh, it was at 0 0.8 trillion, $800 billion. Today we're at, uh, we, we touched 9 trillion. Uh, we're just under that. And to get back to paraphrasing, John Hussman, <laughs> a balance sheet of this size is like keeping a nuclear bomb in the basement. And so I want to end with another joke. Ben Bernanke won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I highly recommend watching these two videos that we did. This one is very, very enjoyable. I want to thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Ben, Ben, open the helicopter door, then, then, all these dollar bills pour out when he tells me time's good again. Yeah, I can't wait to be racking up my credit card again. Ben, Ben, Ben Bill, Bill, Bill Why bother me today? Still, still You know I promised I would pay you Will you lend me more? Yeah, I'll trade for free I just want those dollar bills to pour Pour down on me Pour, pour down Argentina Why am I in Zimbabwe? I've heard those words And I know history repeats itself Yeah, I know what she's learned But it won't happen this time Expenses, everything's fine, fine, fine. Hey, yeah, fine, fine, fine. And who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks. Any bank or, that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. You tell us who they are. No. Do you think gold is money? No. Argentina, Weimar, and Zimbabwe, I've heard those words, and I know history repeats itself, yeah, I know what she's learned, but it won't happen this time, cause Ben says everything's fine, fine, fine. Hey, 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 fine, fine, fine Ben, Ben, he opens a helicopter door Then, then, all these dollar bills pour out When he tells me time's so good again Yeah, I can't wait to be racking up my credit card again Ben, Ben, Ben Yeah,
helicopter bam 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 helicopter 